Why does the code on the top run 10 times faster than the code on the bottom? Watch this video and find out. Today we're starting a new series on data structures and optimization, and we'll start by talking about arrays, or the array data structure. Having an understanding of what's happening under the hood is super important for performance, so we'll be going into depth on what arrays are, the cool things your computer does to make things faster, we'll talk about why arrays are fast and when they're not, and if you stick around to the end, we'll talk about how this fits into what's coming up next. What are arrays? To put simply, they're a way of storing several items at once. Typically in code, you'll have a situation like this, where you want to store some random crap. I might want to declare some items like uh, float prices equals 199, 299, etc, etc. This is the C++ syntax. Or in JavaScript, it'll look something like const price equals 199, 299. You get the, you get the idea. Now here in the code, prices is my array, and I've got three items in the array. And generally, the property of arrays is that you can look up individual elements in the array by their index. Typically arrays are zero indexed, meaning the first element starts with index zero. So if I want to refer to the first element, it's prices at zero. And then the second is prices at one, and so on. What does this have to do with memory? So now, when I talk about arrays, I'm going to be talking about them in the sense of C++ or C Sharp or a language like that, where they're the exact same type of items, be it an array of floats, integers, or complex structs, and the memory is contiguous. So what's a contiguous array? When we're talking about a contiguous array, what we mean is that the memory for the array is all together in one big lump. If you're not quite sure what that means, recall how memory works. Now this is a simplified view of how memory works on your computer. You've got this giant block of data. I'll draw this big rectangle that represents memory on your computer, and it's divided up into billions and billions of these slots that fit a single byte. Each slot has an address, which is incrementing from one to the next, in the same way that houses on streets have addresses, which means that every byte in memory is addressable by its address. When you allocate a variable, what you're doing is allocating space for your variable somewhere in memory, be it on the stack or heap. For example, if I'm allocating space for a single 32-bit float, that's 32 bits, or 4 bytes, so we get this little block of memory here. So a contiguous block of memory would mean that, let's say I allocate a big chunk of memory, it would mean that all of the bytes for the memory I requested are consecutive, with no gaps between them. And non-contiguous would mean that it's fragmented between different places in memory. So maybe a little here and a little there with spaces in between. It's the difference between having a whole cookie or a fragmented one. All good so far? Let's talk about some of the cool things your computer does for you. But to do that, we're going to take a step back and walk through a real-world problem. Let's say that you're my assistant. I work on big important things, and I ask you to look up something for me. Let's say it's a chapter in a book. So you head to the library, look up the book, copy the chapter, and bring it back to me. Job done. Then I ask you for something else. Maybe the next chapter. In general, if your job is to head to the library and get crap for me, how can you save some time? There's two easy strategies you can employ. The first is, instead of just copying the chapter I want, you could have just checked out the entire book. That way, once you get back to the office, if I ask you for something else and it happens to be in the same book, well, Job done. You get it back to me in a fraction of the time. This is what the L1, L2, L3 caches are for. Another thing you can do is try to predict what I will want next. If you can see that I'm binge-watching seasons of Rick and Morty, and I'm on season 2, you can predict I'll need season 3 really soon and get it before I even ask. This is prefetching. The L1, 2, 3 caches. When you go to buy a computer, for example, let me head over to the Apple website, and I'll just click on the MacBook Pro option. I don't actually own one of these. They're super expensive, and I'm super cheap, but I like looking at them. Anyway, here in the tech spec section, you can find mention of the size of the L3 cache. Over here on the AMD website, I can find mention of the L1 and L2 caches as well. So what are these, and how do they work? Most modern CPUs come with a bit of built-in memory in the form of these caches. And there's often an L1 and an L2 cache, and usually an L3 cache as well. This is basically super ultra-fast memory that the CPU can use to save things. 
When you do a read from memory, you don't just pull a single byte or whatever it is that you asked for from memory. What actually happens is a whole sequence of operations. Starting at the CPU, it goes and checks the L1 cache, then the L2 cache, then finally the L3 cache, looking for the data you're requesting. Each of these is successfully costlier to fetch from, but also each of these is successively bigger. And of course, they're all way, way faster than getting it from main memory. And if at one of these stages you get a cache hit, like let's say the data was in L1 already, or maybe it missed L1 but you hit L2, great. You return the data and move on with your life. If you get a cache miss, that means that you have to reach all the way out to main memory, which is pretty costly, on the order of at least a 100 times more costly than having it immediately available. At that point, instead of just pulling in that small bit of data you asked, it pulls in what's called a cache line, which is 64 bytes which is why on subsequent requests, you may get a cache hit. You see, the whole 64 bytes was cached somewhere, and so you don't have to request it specifically now. But wait, there's more. Remember I mentioned that uh, you might also try to predict what I'm going to watch next based on what I'm watching now? Well, guess what the CPU does for you? There's a prefetcher unit that fills that exact same role. It lives sort of between the CPU and the caches, looking at what you request from memory. The exact details of how any given hardware prefetch is implemented is totally vendor specific and obviously complex, but the gist of it is that if your memory accesses follow an easy recognizable pattern, for example, you're iterating over the array one by one, or with a constant stride, that works too, then what happens is the hardware can pull memory into the cache that you haven't specifically requested yet, and when you do use it, cache it. What does any of this have to do with arrays, if anything? We're almost there. But first, one last quick tangent. Dynamic arrays. These are arrays that can grow to accommodate more items. And these are just implemented really simply by allocating more memory than you needed to begin with and keeping track of where the end of the array is. That's all. They're still contiguous chunks of memory and we'll be talking about dynamic arrays at this point. They're practically the same thing for our purposes. Okay, again, what does this have to do with arrays? Arrays are contiguous chunks of memory. CPUs love operating on contiguous chunks of memory, which is why operations like, say, iterating over a list, they're super fast. Pretty much can't give the CPU a better scenario. Accessing elements randomly is also pretty fast. Accessing a random element just involves a memory read, since you can calculate the address trivially from the start of the array although you'll probably incur a cache miss, but that's not a big deal. And appending items to an array, assuming that you have space, or removing them from the end of an array, is super fast. It should be somewhat obvious that it just involves copying or removing a single thing. So what sucks? It's not particularly difficult to run into scenarios where arrays are pretty bad. Finding an element in an array is slow, since you kind of have to check every element one by one. This might not be a big deal when you have a small array, but imagine you have billions. You want some way to do it faster. So, finding sucks. Also, inserting or removing items from anywhere except the end, it gets progressively slower and slower the closer you are to the start of the array. And it's not hard to see why. Here's your array as a big rectangle, and I'll just go ahead and dump a bunch of numbers in there. And now you want to remove the second last item. Well, it's not the end of the world. You simply copy the last item into that spot, and then mark the array as being a little bit smaller. Job done. But if you have to do an operation at the beginning, you can kind of see where this is going. Let's say I have to remove the first item. Well, this is going to suck, because I have to move every single item in the array over by one. How do we make this better? This is where more advanced data structures come in. But it's not actually possible to understand more advanced ones without a solid basis in arrays, funnily enough. They're foundational. For example, hash tables. These are often implemented as a combination of arrays and linked lists. So yeah, you might be able to understand what a hash table does, but not how it does it. Anyway, we'll follow up this with linked lists in the future, so stay tuned for that. Hope you enjoyed this and learned something in the process. Cheers.